Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the 401 Access Tonight podcast. I'm the host of the show, Joe Carson, Chief Security Scientist and Advisory Sizzle at Delanea. And I'm really excited about today's episode. We've basically been really kind of looking at all different areas of the industry for thought leadership, for expertise. And I think this is a really important topic. And I'm really joined with a very special guest, someone who I met quite a number of years ago, just by chance uh, at a conference. Uh, it was RSA, I believe. Um, so I'm joined by the awesome Gideon. Um, Gideon, do you want to give the audience a bit of a background about who you are, what you do, and uh, some things about how you're getting in, into the industry? Sure, Joe. First, thanks so much for having me. Um, my background is uh, starting off in the U.S. Air Force and then a variety of corporations, but um, across industries, insurance, uh, pharmaceuticals, banking, um, state government, so startups, so a, a great um, exposure to different types of businesses, which has mm -hmm. been fun. And um, I started out as a full-time employee and went up through the leadership chain to being an executive, a CISO, and then over time I transitioned into consulting and supporting people. Fantastic. And uh, I mean, your background gives you a really good kind of setup for, you know, a lot of regulation and the governance side of things, because a lot of those industries you, you mentioned uh, do have a lot of, you know, policies and, and regulations and uh, standards that has to be adhered to. Um, one of the things that I was interested in as well, one of the roles that you're doing today is a virtual CISO. Um, you want to give me a better background. What, what does a virtual CISO? We've heard a lot about CISOs and, and what the CISO role is. And uh, what does a virtual CISO do? And and what's the types of things that you provide organizations from a consultancy pers perspective? Sure. So my focus, moreover, is on the client and their needs. So that will vary. Um, it ends up being in two different types of spaces. One I would refer to as program architecture. So if mm -hmm. you think of a CISO, he or she is one person and everyone looks to them and it's not just a cybersecurity program, but it's all the sub programs beneath that. So oftentimes they'll either want to build out a new program or there's a program that needs attention and they'll bring me in for help with that. Uh, I will also help them prepare for board presentations mm -hmm. and, and strategy. I have one client that three times a year I, I face off in a, a triannual committee meeting and then mm -hmm. for three days, we just do brainstorming and working sessions. It's really, it, it's it, it's exciting actually. And then really the second type of service I get pulled into is assessments. And mm -hmm. again, needs of the client. So there, I won't do a straight like NIST cybersecurity framework or ISO framework mm -hmm. assessment. It's typically much deeper than that. And mm -hmm. uh, it may cover heavily, like I've got someone right now asking me to focus on insider threat. Uh, I've done assessments that dealt with um, 911 operations mm -hmm. uh, deeply in an investment department. So I get involved in business processes quite frequently. So um, mm -hmm. there's oftentimes there's opportunity there because people in, in our career field, a lot of times we focus on what I call enterprise security and, and kind mm -hmm. of tech and it's hard to have the capacity and the funding to get past that and oftentimes mm -hmm. the lines of business the business units they're kind of out on their own and mm -hmm. I, I dig in and try to understand what the processes are that are critical to their services and then what controls are in place to protect them and make them successful absolutely i think that's a really important role one of the things we find is a lot of organizations who have brought in a lot of new CISOs because we've had, you know, CISOs has been something of an area of growth for many organizations and many organizations that might be the first time uh, they're having a CISO or the CISO that they bring on, it might be one of their first major roles as a CISO. And they do find that a lot of organizations in that position, um, they might be coming from a very technical background and they don't have that business acumen. And it's really important to have those seasoned experts who can spread their experience across multiple organizations to really give them the ability to, well, here's what you're used to be doing, but in order for you to be successful with the board, 
this is how you need to transition into that. These are the skills that you need to be able to go and do budgetary assessments or these are the things that you need to be able to translate into what the board understands. And I think that's a very important role to make sure that we're able to you know, provide that expertise to, to CISOs who might be coming from different backgrounds. And to your point, I think it's really important as well as organizations who might you know, have been doing the CISO in a certain uh, you know, methodology for a number of years. And they, they now need to tra- change that methodology where it was very much enterprise focused or technology focused to being much more into business resiliency or into how it right. applies to the business functions. So I think that's a really important role. And it's great that you're doing that and, and seeing that many organizations are getting the value. Um, and hopefully, I mean, there's a lot of CISOs who, you know, that experience and that knowledge uh, will make them very successful going forward um, because, you know, it's, it, it is a very important function. One of the things you mentioned, Aron, is those assessment side of things. And this is what I want to kind of dive into for today's episode is a lot, we hear a lot about governance, risk and compliance. And there's a lot of different, you know, theories out there, a lot of different approaches and a lot of uh, different kind of methodologies. Uh, can you so give, give us a bit of a summary into what GRC or governance, risk and compliance is? What, what does it mean um, from your side and, and what it comes into to doing security for an organization? Great. So. I think I would start with that cybersecurity has a lot of complexity to it. Mm -hmm. And it's easy for people to get lost in that complexity or not have consistent process execution. So that that sounds kind of (laughs) high level and wonky, right? But um, really what it comes down to is there there are many times, I think many of us watch and and watch podcasts like yours Mm -hmm. and, and read articles and blog entries And a lot of times it's not, I remember back in the day, they used to say, you know, Chuck Norris and a gang of ninjas. It's not, (laughs) you know, or, you know, it was an advanced persistent threat and, you know, it it was a hostile nation state. And when when you find out what was missing, oftentimes it's very foundational things like um, missing MFA or things we should know better. Reuse passwords and uh, people clicking on something or accidental, uh, not having security even configured correctly. It's, on, it's a lot of times it's the basics which we get wrong. Right. So uh, I'll give you an example. I spent about four years in uh, PCI payment card mm-hmm. um, compliance for a large financial institution, and I'm now supporting a startup doing that mm-hmm. from scratch. And PCI is a good example. Um, whether it's PCI or NIST CSF or what it, whatever it is you're doing, there's a term I use, compliance jitter. So mm-hmm. something may be in place at one point and then it comes out of place. So there's two things that I look to have is one I call activity task scheduling. So if you look down through whether it's PCI or NIST CSF or ISO, mm-hmm. there's things that you have to do throughout the year Um, weekly, monthly, quarterly. And what I try to do is put that in a scheduling tool Mm -hmm. and have very specific instructions on what needs to be done, assign it to somebody there perhaps as a procedures manual. Obviously, we try to automate everything that we can. But the idea behind that, uh, and I think this is core GRC, is I want to put those kind of pedestrian routine tasks that are very important behind us a little bit. So we're focused Mm -hmm. forward on things like cyber threat intelligence, um, threat hunting, all of the things that Mm -hmm. really bring us to work. And um, also I like to build into whatever sub program I'm dealing with, like third party risk management. I like to build QA into that process. So Mm -hmm. there's uh, mission vision, process procedure, system of record, Mm -hmm. reporting, metrics, and then at the very end, your, your highest level of maturity is you build in light, lean, quality assurance. So there's mm-hmm. areas where you think left alone with everything else that's going on, maybe some of these things won't happen. And to have the team check itself, not learn from mm-hmm. an incident or a compromise or an auditor. Yeah, Le- learn from actually you know practicing the control and making sure you've actually put it in place correctly which is a lot of where the mistakes come from. And a lot of where the attackers take advantage of that is when we try to do things quickly, 
and we're not having somebody follow up and checking in those types of controls um, and waiting. You know, and, and it also means that when you get the auditor coming in, it means you've also done your due diligence as well. And it makes you more likely that you're going to uh, be successful and pass the audit on the first time and not have to go back and correct a lot of things. Um, so when you put that quality assurance in, it does really mean uh, that you're getting the quality first time. Um, and you're also making sure you're learning from that process as well. So you can actually make sure in the future, because it is a lot of repeat, you know, you, as you mentioned, you have those repeatable actions and tasks that need to go continuously. Um, you might do it multiple times a year. You might do it once a year, uh, but it also means that when you come back to doing that, you can sometimes even get to the point where it becomes much more automated. Um, to your point is, you know, where it allows you to then start focusing on the more proactive types of controls the more things around, you know, checking to make sure that no one malicious in your network, no one's abusing the access. Um, and also in the supply chain as well, it means that when you go into multiple suppliers, you have a repeatable process that you can apply to each of those rather than having to do net new every single time you onboard a new supplier that might touch those controls. Uh, what's, some of the, what's some of the methodology? You mentioned about PCI and uh, this uh, cybersecurity framework. Uh, what's some of the methodologies that you put in place when you're looking at, um, you know, an organization who's looking to assess uh, their compliance or regulatory, you know, ability? Gotcha. So I like the NIST cybersecurity framework, mm -hmm. and I understand we have an international audience here. So that's mm -hmm. that's distinctly American. I think whether it's NIST CSF or ISO, I think that's fine. Um, I'm kind of excited because the second version of the NIST cybersecurity framework is coming out. It'll be published in February. And I'm a controls wonk. So um, <laughs> I, I, I really went through, I provided a lot of feedback in the, the feedback period. And then I've looked at the draft and they've said not much will change. So the framework itself is pretty stable, but they've released implementation control examples and there are 357 of them. So. I don't think I'm not compliance driven. So I don't, mm -hmm. uh, it, to me, it's not, oh, they've come out with 357 mm -hmm. implementation examples. Let's go do that. It's more, I like risk lenses. So I mm -hmm. like to look at different um, control frameworks. Um, there's the Center for Internet uh, Security. Mm -hmm. They have their critical security controls. So I think it's great to look at many different control frameworks and kind of pull pieces out. But again, I like to kind of get that in a way behind me a little bit so we can focus. Uh, if you think about the way that a security team works, there's day-to-day -day operations, mm -hmm. there's the annual program goals, the employees themselves have um, performance and development mm -hmm. plans that they have to execute to. Um, so I, I think one of the things that GRC and these control frameworks do for us is they make sure we're doing the basics. And mm -hmm. you know, if we have a good GRC program uh, with a system of record and um, ways to influence remediation, uh, a seat at, at the table at the board, maybe a cybersecurity mm -hmm. committee, risk register entries, wow, that's a terrific way to influence change. Um, mm -hmm. but to me, it's the, much of the focus and all of the frameworks mentioned risk analysis, risk assessment, and that just gets skipped over. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's um, having your cyber threat intel program, but not just having it be a coffee break where we all get together and right. kind of share interesting things. It's having an intake process and mm -hmm. saying, look, we're as these things come out, someone's going to analyze them and we're going to choose specifically as their recommendations. I think CISA is doing a great job recently mm -hmm. of saying, these are the commercial tools adversaries are using. Uh, these, these are things that you should be doing uh, to detect an adversary. Uh, and I'm much more into the TTPs, the um, mm -hmm. techniques, uh, techniques, tactics, and procedures versus IOCs, mm -hmm. indicators of compromise. Um, and then going out off and actually, here's, here's a concept, not just passively letting the SIM run and passively mm -hmm. waiting on the SOC but doing threat hunting. I think GRC gives us capacity. I mentioned four times a year, I do three days <laughs> of just insane um, um, working sessions, mm -hmm. strategy meetings with a phenomenal team. 
And there's a lot that comes out of that. So you need the capacity to actually go off and do those things. Absolutely. I think it's really important. It also means that organizations can better scale um, and also spend more time, you know, making, you know, also doing the simulations as well and being ready. Because uh, I will say that, you know, if you just spend time focusing on basically, you know, doing the controls and doing the controls, you, what you end up doing is you just you, you get in this rut of not being able to uh, meet the business needs and be prepared for when bad things happen. It all just becomes a fire drill. And I think that's the worst thing for a security team and an organization is when you're a fire drill and you haven't basically done, you haven't caught the incidents, you know, early enough um, to minimize the impact where possible. Uh, so I think that's really important to make sure, as you mentioned, you know, it's it's really getting getting ahead of 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 the controls and getting to the point where it also laws that means that you're also able to spend some time on newer technologies and newer methodologies as well in order to seeing how that might be able to adopt into your organization, whether it being looking at you know pass keys to go down the path of you know a passwordless experience or whether it being look at you know uh, uh, purple teaming in regards to understanding how your both offensive and defensive teams can work together. Uh, whether it being mapping out to new business areas where you can make sure that, you know, understanding it from a business risk perspective. Uh, I think that's great in issues. And the more time organizations spend on that, the more they become dynamic and adaptive to the threats rather than basically being this, you know, point in time thermometer temperature check. Um, you start actually saying, let's not, you know, every day just dress for, you know, uh, the weather that's outside. Let's make sure we have the right readiness for the climate and for the, you know, the, the, the season that we're about to approach. And it's a very different way of approaching uh, from a security perspective. <laughs> so I love that you brought up incident response and, and exercises. Mm -hmm. So, so huge. Uh, I had an exec that once said, you know, if, if you don't do exercises, it's like, going to play football and that first game, you just kind of walk out there and you wing it. And, you know, the, the other teams really, they're going to own you. So um, there's a couple of things that I do with exercises and, and anyone can adopt is it depends on the organization you're with. You don't want to go off and do a proper exercise to begin with, with injects and, and all mm -hmm. of the sophisticated things and really kind of break down and have the, the cyber and IT team fail. Um, and you want to start, in my opinion, with an exercise where, say, you've got nine different scenarios mm -hmm. that you're going through, kind of common scenarios like we lost a laptop out of somebody's car, and you give them A, B, C, D, and what's the mm -hmm. best answer? And we kind of talk about that. And that first time they get used to Oh, okay, we're, we're going to be in the hot seat a little bit here. And maybe you do that the first time you leave senior leadership out of that one. And you see how that goes. You might do a second one of those, and then you start to get into proper injects. And maybe you do one of those, see how that goes. And then eventually, over time, you start to bring in senior leadership. Mm -hmm. And you also exercise crisis communications. So a lot of places that I go to, they have an incident response plan. And I think in the back of senior leadership's minds, somehow the CISO and the security team are going to be responding to this incident, trying to determine what accesses the, the adversary has, eradicate them from the mm -hmm. IT environment. And at the same time, we're, we're going to clone ourselves and we're going to go <laughs> write press releases and, and speak to the media. So obviously we can't do that. And I would say I'm not well suited don't don't have me go off and speak to the media. I'm just not trained for that. You need training. So um, I spend a fair amount of time um, helping people create a crisis communication plan with holding template uh, statements for common scenarios and then including that whole process. So we're not just going to say, all right, we're going to do the tabletop exercise and we're going to exercise IT and uh, the security staff, but also we're going to say, okay, you know, while we're doing this, here's a little information. Mm -hmm. What would you do, crisis management team? What holding statement template mm -hmm. would you pull down? There's the potential for eight different entities that maybe, depending on their criteria and their laws or regulations, we're going to have to notify. So to make it real mm -hmm. for them too. 
No, absolutely. I think you really, but for me, you brought up a, such an important point is about, you know, we can't treat into response plans and strategies like we did in the past. And, and organizations, they had, you know, they had an IT support and that kind of kind of evolved into this into response but we have to remember today is into response is no longer just a, a, an it response or a technical response it's actually a business response and that means that when you look at your into response plan you think is do you have the business functions included in that plan and strategy do you have the people as you mentioned do you have the right people who's going to be communicating from a press perspective and you have all those scenarios played out and ready. The last thing you want to be doing is doing your you know, sophisticated cyber attack press statement in the middle of an incident. That's the last yeah. scenario you want to be doing. Um, having your legal team uh, understanding about what are your accountability and responsibility when it comes to regulations and compliance frameworks. Having your finance team understanding about do you have the ability to pay uh, you know, the, the ransom in, in cryptocurrency. And I see a lot of times in incidents, I see that's where organizations waste a lot of time because they haven't prepared that scenario is about what do we do have to pay? What do we do have to consider? Do we have the ability to get those funds? So it gets into where I always say that, you know, in response today, we have to change it from being a technical in response, which is that traditional method. You know, it's the IT team or security teams need, it's their responsibility. They will sort it out. Um, but we now we need to involve the entire business. It's a business response to, to security incidents because it impacts the, the business itself. And this gets into me uh, as well. One of the things we, the SEC you know, brought out the new disclosure rule recently. Yeah. And that has a big, massive change in its response even today, where during this response, it was all about getting the business back to operations. Now with those, for example, that SEC ruling means that you have deny as part of your response team, determine material impact to your business which means that you're going to have to have somebody within that incident response team who is financially acronym about, well, does this incident have a material impact to you if we go to do our financial results at the end of the quarter or end of the year, whatever it might be, does this incident have a material impact to those filings? And that's where you need to start thinking about, well, now we need to think about reporting that to the SEC. So this is really where, you know, I think we have to start you know, building those bridges with a business and making sure right. that we're able to bring a lot of those traditional components into where there's some type of, and we've seen Bizos, you know, playing that role, whether, you know, embed it within the business to, to create those bridges. Uh, but I think it's really important to become much more established going forward. And that uh, the CISO does have somebody who's probably either on their team or sitting on another team that allows that translation um, uh, going forward, do you see this as as, as a kind of an area that you know you've been involved in more, or you're seeing organizations realizing the importance of this when it comes to to the you know that the dependency of technology in the business today? It depends on the size and complexity of the organization. So I've been, without naming names, I've been in some very large corporations, and you're right, they have um, BISOs, um, and the reason being is. Some of those lines of business in a large company are, are you know, medium-sized organizations <laughs> if you were to separate them. So there's that complexity. And also, I think it's important always for security to be embedded mm -hmm. um, at the right level because, to me, you want to enable the, the business to do whatever it is they need to do and kind mm -hmm. of have it be frictionless. Um, and you need to be involved to be relevant to them. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I also, I think earlier I mentioned um, being involved with the board and the, having a, a cybersecurity uh, steering committee. I think it's important when you get involved in the board to realize that um, the committee meeting that you're in, there's probably four or six others of those that also meet three times a year. So about once a month, uh, the CEO, the COO, they sit and, and somebody like us comes and says, mm -hmm. this is the most important thing. We need your support. We need your undivided attention. So um, I've had enough exposure to that that I realize it's important for me to bring risk transparency mm -hmm. and recommendations and give them the information they need to make informed decisions. I mean, uh, businesses are in the business of making money. So they need to make decisions on what amount of risk they're willing to take. And there are times where the combination of um, 
people process and technology and cyber is very expensive. Mm -hmm. So they may decide to defer for a year or so and take that risk. And I think as long as we're communicating that effectively, that's fine. Absolutely. And that brings an important point is that, you know, especially, and this is why governance risk and compliance is really important for scissors is that it's their, it's their, you know, ability to translate that into when they actually meet with the board, because that's, it's not technology and security that gives you the weapon to go to the board and get budgetary decisions and get acceptance and gets, you know, the ability to uh, develop your program. It's the risk and compliance, because that's what the language the board speaks. That's what they understand. That's where they actually make a lot of decisions is based on, you know, the financial risk. What's our exposure here? Do we have coverage? Do we have insurance? Do we have, you know, cash in the bank that, you know, when a rainy day happens, we can pull out and, and actually apply here? What's our capability of mitigating it and minimizing this risk? Are we heavily exposed and we have to find other ways to mitigate it? And that's where they get into is that if you're just coming up with a technology uh, proposal without actually having the GRC support in the background to help you, you know, bring that decision to the board, you're going to get a lot of denies. You're going to be sitting on a shoestring budget trying to achieve those. And unless you can actually have that GRC component to support your communication. And this is something that I learned. Uh, it was an interesting uh, you know, I've done lots of conversations and board meetings and, and, and looking at from a security perspective. And I was uh, mentioned it was I did a workshop last year. And one of the things the value that they, they mentioned to me was what they do is when they they have their presentations ready to go to the board meetings. And what they do is they start with a final conclusion. <laughs> they start with the last slide because that's what the board wants to understand is where do you want to be? And then what's your basically and then they will start asking you questions. They will ask you questions based on where your goals and where your vision is. And then that's where you look at basically a, a more interaction conversation. Forget the fluff, forget the journey to that final slide, put that at the front and start there. And the rest of the actual presentation becomes an appendix. It becomes a supporting argument for what your requests are. And I always thought that was very interesting is get straight to the point, get straight to what yeah. you want to achieve. Um, because ultimately you have very little time in those areas. And if you've done that, you know, risk side of things very effectively, that will make sure that you're able to support and have that append appendix that's going to support your goals. That's great. Yeah. Go ahead. So one of the things that kind of, <laughs> you mentioned a couple of the frameworks you mentioned, uh, you, know, you know, PCI for me, you know, and, and looking at them uh, holistically, I think it's very important as well is because they do have a lot of overlaps. A lot of them have overlaps. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you'll find that when you look at one control of one, you know, whether it be PCI or, uh, the basically uh, top, you know, critical security controls, or you look at the NIST, you'll find these overlaps everywhere. I do believe, I, you know, I, I do like, and, and some of those controls take a long time to be updated as well. Um, some of them are, you know, an, an old revisions. Um, and what gets me is, is that a lot of these are even predating artificial intelligence, you know, the, the acceleration yeah. that we've seen in the past year. Um, and I do like, I do like for me, this, uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework is definitely a very solid one. And it, and it provides a lot of those practical examples, as you mentioned, those scenarios and deployment examples. I think those are fantastic because that's what the industry needs is that don't just tell me a legal kind of control, um, you know, proposal, tell me how it can apply to me and how I can make the most best, you know, value out of it for the organization. And that's where I've seen that maturity. You know, we're, in, in recent years, they had the risk model, which was fantastic. They brought that into it. They brought the phased approach and now the actually uh, working examples. What other types of uh, frameworks do you see is, you know, what, where's the resources um, that you also use? What, what resources do you use to support your, your uh, assessments and, and work? Well, one, I, I now have a massive set of work papers <laughs> um, from doing all of these different types of assessments. So. I still am very focused if I engage with a client to understand what type of business mm -hmm. are they in, you know, logically what type of threat actors might that bring, you know, where, what types of sensitive data and, and kind of coach them through maybe we should follow that and be focused on that. Another thing that comes to mind uh, based on what you've said too is we talk a lot about cyber. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found um, in my career and as a VC so is we we as CISOs, as security executives, get pulled into what I'd say is the chief risk officer role. So um, there are times where I'll say to people, for example, I'll, I'll be in a program for a couple of years running it 
and I'll say, look, privacy is very important as well. And, and NIST has, um, I think, a good start at a framework, the, the NIST Privacy Framework version one. And I'll say these 29 controls are cyber, and they're almost literally copied from NIST CSF. And yep. then there's 71 other controls, and there's some overlap, like having an inventory. But I'll say these 71 controls who do we have doing this? And and oftentimes, if you ask that question, I'll warn you, you end up doing those 71 controls. But also, and I do a deck on this, um, there's an intersection of fraud in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful in your organization because typically, if you go to a CISO and you go, are, are you responsible for fraud? Or have you taken a look at that? They'll say, absolutely not. That's the CFO. And if you go over to the CFO, these are some of the things I do in assessment. <laughs> I'll say, to what extent are, are you all looking to identify and mitigate um, risk, you know, fraud, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, and they'll say, oh, well, we have an annual assessment done on that. Don't take that <laughs> at face value. And then you ask and you say, well, well great. That's terrific. Is that an annual fraud assessment by, you know, one of the big four or something like that? And if you dig a little further, you'll find out they have their standard annual assessment. And as an upsell opportunity, all of the consulting firms will do like a half hour mm -hmm. on fraud prevention. And they'll say, you know, you don't have the fun, you don't have a fraud response plan. You don't have a litany of things. And we really would recommend every time, if you can get some of those reports, they all say someone really should do fraud examination and dig in here. So mm -hmm. that's something I do focus on because really you've got uh, the CFO saying like, it's really not me and and um, security say, saying it's really not us. So I do like to do a little oversight in that space. Absolutely, you bring up a really important topic because you know we've seen a lot of increase I mean, there's lots of different risks that we've seen in the past year increase. And definitely one of those main areas has been business email compromise, which is very much sitting right in the middle of that financial fraud scenario, because it's all right. about modifying, uh, you know, the path where the payments are going or changing invoices or sending a fake invoice the day before the real one comes in and uh, or just getting the accountant to send money uh, based on you know some type of acquisition or, you know, type of uh, purchase or so forth. And when you get into it, was that a cyber, you know, scenario control that the, you know, the CISO yeah. should have been covering? Or is that a scenario where the CFO should have the right controls in place? But you're absolutely right. It's both. <laughs> it's that both of them need to make sure that they're collaborating and making sure that one is the security controls are, you know, identifying the possible areas and that the actually financial controls are making sure that um, a certain checks are done before, uh, you know, the payments are made. Uh, validations and so forth. And you're not taking it at face value or you're getting a, an email coming in and you're only trusting the email as a single source um, of you know, authorization or a phone call comes in because we've had a lot of you know, deep fakes being on the rise as well. Uh, we're basically modifying the voices and videos and you might be seeing someone that you're familiar with or their voice might sound exactly like they are. Um, and you know, you know, demand that you need to transfer funds because there's this deadline. If you don't do it immediately, it's not going to happen. It's going to be your fault. Mm -hmm. And people will do that. They'll 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 make the exceptions, and ultimately, then when they find out, you know, it, it was malicious. It was an attacker who who used technology in order to you know, let's say uh, you know, try to find ways around the controls. Um, but I, you know, you're absolutely right. It can't be a finger pointing, and this is why it's really important that there's a collaboration. Uh, between different parts of the business today. Right. I have about, I think it's 15 different fraud scenarios, and they're kind of like finances version of the OWASP top 10. It's nothing <laughs> to be proud of. But um, there's one that I always find interesting where uh, it's called the largest subset growth mm -hmm. scenario. Very <laughs> yeah, uh, financially wonky, right? But the idea behind it is if you visualize financial transactions, there's kind of a pattern to them. You might have quarterly payments that kind of mm -hmm. go like this. Maybe over time, they might go up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then you see one that just goes, whoo! <laughs> so the question is, that doesn't happen in business that mm -hmm. much, right? If you think about it. Uh, so if you're monitoring for that, the, um, oftentimes that type of pattern is fraud. And yeah. the reason behind it, and if you've watched, and I'm sure you have, 
a lot of the fraud documentaries, somebody starts and in the beginning, they're very tepid and nervous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are things that happen in their lives, like they'll go like, well, maybe I'll go on a vacation. Oh, I need a new car. Mm -hmm. Oh, my kid needs a down payment on a house. And that's what starts to, <laughs> to bring it up. So somebody needs to look. There's uh, specialized software for that, and there's certified fraud examiners. So um, just a fascinating space to get involved in. Yeah, I love that. I think I saw it was uh, last year I went to uh, it was a uh, event where – uh, the CISO was actually showing their annual budgetary spend. Uh, it was quite interesting where uh, for uh, every year during the month of August, the spend went to zero. <laughs> and then every, so every year you had that because the CISO went on vacation. And then any time you saw a spend, it was an anomaly, was a suspicious spend because the CISO was on vacation and it should not uh -huh. occur. And it was an interesting watching. He was showing, you know, um, this is how he does his plans throughout the year and how he does his, you know, the budget approach and where he does his spend. And you know, everyone was all seeing this one month August vacation. He's like, and he said, anytime, you know, they've got the controls put in place, because anytime there's a spend, that triggers automatic suspicion because he has to sign off on this. So uh, it was an interesting scenario is that we use that historical trends and historical data in order to find those outliers, because you're absolutely right, is that the ones that are tend to be ad hoc or you know, on the cuff or they're, they're just not following the previous norms, they should be flagged immediately uh, and not just done, um, you know, is, is you know, that's uh, the urgency sometimes that they come under. Or the, the transactions that float right beneath the uh, threshold for further evaluation like that sign off. So, yeah, it's a fascinating space to, to be involved in and as a mm -hmm. cyber professional to dip into and kind of help make sure that we're doing the right thing in finance. And sometimes it's, you want to have that conversation one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. in the beginning, but maybe it's something you whisper. If the conversation doesn't go well, you might whisper <laughs> in the COO's ear, hey, you know, there's a gap mm -hmm. here. Absolutely. So for the, for the audience, you know, that's looking to get started in this area, you know, there might be, you might have an organization who um, they might've been doing this for a while, but they're looking to, let's say, modernize their program. Or you might have a new CISO that's just starting off and they're getting into GRC and, you know, they're getting advice. What's a good place for them to get started? Where would you point them to in order to, you know, uh, where it would help them, whether it being a good training course or is there good books out there that might, you know, help them, you know, prepare and, and, and get ready for this path that, uh, and journey they might go on? Great. So to me, if... if someone understands IT, so obviously you can't just leap into the cyber domain, right? So if you have a basic understanding of IT and it can come from an infrastructure space or development space, once you have that, um, when, when I have people and I, I spend a lot of Fridays for a half hour with these calls, they say, how do I get into cyber? I always say start with the NIST cybersecurity framework. It's Today it's 106 controls down the road, it's gonna be 108. So it's kind of a nice way, mm -hmm. if, if someone's thinking about getting into cyber to get a flavor or a feel for what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I just think uh, going to security conferences and uh, w where we cross all the time, <laughs> Joe, like everywhere I go, there you are. Um, and then your local, mm -hmm. your local security chapters, I think are great. Um, mm -hmm. You know, ISACA, ISC Squared, um, in the U.S., InfraGuard. And mm -hmm. I always say have have friends with dark circles. <laughs> so it's great. You know, there, there are times where I get myself mm -hmm. into trouble, where I'm on the edge. You know, there's no such thing as a cyber expert. We all have areas yeah. where we just haven't had time. We're human beings. We're only here so long. So you don't have a lot of experience in X area or domain it's great to be able to put out a call to a buddy and get that help. Absolutely. And I use that quite often as well, because, you know, there's only so much I can, uh, you know, absorb and, 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 you know, become knowledgeable in. Uh, so what I've done is I've built up my community of experts. Is the, Those are the people that when I know um, I need uh, their advice, I go to them uh, because that's what they do all day long. That's the specific area that they are, you know, um, you know, excited in and that they are developing their skills in um, and vice versa. They come to me when it's, you know, it's areas of privilege escalation or, you know, uh, password hygiene and so forth and access controls. Um, so absolutely, you, you, you spot on is that 
make sure to, to be aware of the community around you, um, to, you know, get involved in and start, you know, going and listening to talks and sessions and, and finding out what's up, what's out there and then building up your network of, 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 you know, that knowledge as well, because, um, it's two ways as well is, you know, I, you know, I, I've reached out to a lot of mentors and, and the network around me to help me out of areas or to help provide me uh, direction. Uh, but also, you know, vice versa. You know, I've had people come out and, and, and ask for my advice as well. Uh, so you're absolutely spot on. I think that's a great way, uh, you know, to, in order to, to really uh, kind of find out, kind of also can, it allows you to find out what you're interested in specifically because as well, you know, it will help you develop your skills and also the path that you might go on. Because cybersecurity, it's, it's a massive industry. There are so yeah. many areas that, um, you know, are even being introduced, uh, you know, quite frequently. We talked a little bit about, you know, generative AI and AI as well, um, which is going to have a massive impact on, on governance and compliance going forward, where it becomes even the point where it'll be real time. You know, you, you'll be not just doing that one assessment per year. It'll be basically, you know, uh, assessment in real time all the time um, and allow you to modify and, and, and uh, you know, uh, to, uh, configure and uh, change the controls uh, as you need to. Um, so, so let's put on. Uh, what what are his, uh, kind of you know what, what one one kind of part of advice would you leave the audience? What what would you say is you know uh, some some things to be prepared for uh, for the year ahead? Um, so one, I always like to have a plan. So mm -hmm. um, I, I th and I, I think that plan evolves, and um, I, I think it's if I were to say one thing. Start your year and say we're going to have um, three days of, of just strategy and brainstorming sessions. And don't make it so that that schedule and those topics are all written by the leader. And it doesn't matter who the leader is. It's just that's one person. I always say to whatever team I'm working with, we own the program. I always get very uncomfortable if someone says, you know, it's Gideon's program or it's Joe's program. Mm -hmm. So I think if you set aside three days, even if you do it just once in the summer, mm -hmm. it helps you kind of level set where the program is today and where we need to do work moving forward. And again, I do that with one organization uh, triannually, which is intense, but uh, the program, the maturity of the program is just growing exponentially. And we're also really very much in tune with the threat landscape. Absolutely. I think you've brought, that's a very important part is that it's the, it's the team ownership is that if you have it as a person, that person owns it. But if you have it as a we, we all are participating and we all have value for it to be successful together. And I absolutely, you know, what you mentioned reminds me of uh, I participate in a number of hackathons throughout the year. And those hackathons are a great way to take those problems uh, and to really come out at the end of, you know, the few days with solutions um, that everyone's involved. Um, so a great way to, 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 to bring people together and, and at the same time have fun because at the end, of, yeah. we want, we want to have fun in this industry as well. Um, Gideon, it's been amazing having you on the show. We'll make sure that uh, the audience, uh, what, what, what ways uh, can the audience you know, get in contact with you if they're looking to reach out, ask from a demo, some additional questions or get advice from you, what's the best way? So probably just reach out via LinkedIn. Uh, my, my profile's mm -hmm. open, so if someone wants to send a message or connect. Um, I'm very social. I spend, uh, I probably have four half-hour sessions with, <laughs> you know, college students, individual contributors, mm -hmm. managers, separating veterans. Um, so I, I welcome, obviously I only have so much time on Fridays, <laughs> but uh, usually three, three or four mm -hmm. sessions. So I welcome the conversations. And we always learn from each other, whether mm -hmm. I'm speaking to, you know, a luminary CISO or an individual contributor. I love that exchange. Mm -hmm. So it's great. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so Gideon, it's been amazing having, having you on the show and the episode and your uh, insights and knowledge and is so valuable for the audience. And including me, I, I've learned a lot uh, today from today's session. Um, so for the audience, uh, tune in every two weeks. We have the 401 Access Tonight podcast, again, bringing you amazing content, thought leadership, and, and really ways in order to help provide you more uh, value, experience, and, and help you shape your career to being one that's very successful. So again, thank you. Take care and stay safe. Thanks so much, Joe.